So our next speaker is a computer scientist uh, by trade. But here's the interesting thing. His girlfriend is a biologist. And probably uh, during dinner, they were sharing their stories. And uh, uh, he got very interested in biology. So he said, why don't I combine the two expertises together? Um, and he did a lot of research on um, lipoprotein metabolism at TNO and in the U.S. And through that, he, got, uh, he gathered a lot of experience on not only the standards of bioinformatics, but also open source software. And today he will present the concept of the Hive, open source software for bioinformatics. So without further ado, please welcome Kees van Bokhoven. Thank you. Good luck on your talk. All right, thanks for coming. It's uh, late in the evening and yet you're here to hear more about the Hive. Actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. I'm going to give you a few example projects. Um, but before that, who of you know what open source is? Great, that's uh, almost everyone. Um, I just put a few lo logos on the slide. Um, so basically open source is making sure the software that you make is useful for everyone companies, universities, and um, all of you probably use open source in some fashion, whether it's your Android phone or Firefox. But at the Hive, we use open source for a very specific purpose, uh, bioinformatics. And what we do with this software is we provide support, for example, to pharma companies, uh, to university medical centers, to clinics. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples, but the software packages that we use, uh, you probably don't know them. I mean, ha any of you heard of Transmart or CBioPortal? Okay, I'm go going to tell you all about it. I started a company in 2012 because I was, um, I was indeed uh, coming from computer science. I was starting to, um, to study bioinformatics and I realized that a lot of the open source software that was created in universities wasn't used at all in companies. Companies had their own software and their own world. And I thought it wouldn't be great if we can somehow connect the two. If we can use the software that's created in a university setting or in a research setting um, also to find new drugs or to uh, cure cancer. So that's why I started a company which provides professional services for open source, just like Red Hat does, for example, for Red Hat Linux. Um, we started out here in Utrecht at uh, Utrecht Inc. That's the business incubator of um, uh, Utrecht University at, um, in het Kruidgebouw at the campus. And then um, we quickly um, started providing services to pharma companies, not only in the Netherlands. Actually, in the Netherlands, we have almost no pharma clients because we don't have any pharma companies anymore. Right, uh, we do have biotech though in Leiden, for example, um, and we have a lot of university collaborators. Uh, but most of our clients are worldwide um, pharma companies uh, in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Spain, etc. This is a picture of the team. Um, this is a this is us at our current office at the Weg van de Verenigde Naties, uh, actually not far from here just a few minutes walk. Um, it's a mix of some software developers, uh, but also we have bioinformaticians, we have medical informatics people, uh, biostatistics expertise, and of course, uh, project management and staff. Here you see a picture of um, an event at our company, this was Young CB, which is the Young Computational Biologist. It's a student group in the Netherlands, and they were visiting our offices. And this is a picture of our new office. Um, we're moving next week to another location in Utrecht. And, um, you know, this is a nice uh, meeting room, um, a meeting space, which is, of course, in the shape of the hive. I'm very proud of our new office. As you can see, it's not yet finished, but uh, it should be uh, by next week. 
So here are the, the tools and the projects I will tell you a little bit more about. There are three main uh, areas in which we're active. I'm going to explain all of them. Translational research, population health data, and personal health data. So using wearable sensors. The first one, translational research data, is about the combination of um, patient data with biological data from the same patients. So, uh, for example, clinical attributes like age, gender, with um, bioinformatics stuff, uh, which can be DNA, it can be RNA, so it's the genome, and it's also um, expression, even proteins. There's a lot of stuff you can measure. Example project I have for this kind of data is TRAIT. TRAIT is... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, TRAIT is a project that has all these partners. It's an IT project, and it's supporting the um, projects you see here. So we have in oncology, we have a number of... Um, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, um, different dis diseases, and also cardiovascular. All these pictures represent a project, so uh, CTMM has all these disease-focused projects, and TRAIT is basically the uh, IT project, which is supporting the disease project with infrastructure. Uh, CTMM is rather large. It started a few years ago. It's funded uh, by the Dutch government and a number of companies. Uh, total budget is 300 million euro, uh, but for trade we only had, uh, I think, something like 16 euros. Still a lot. Um, and then uh, together with these partners, we worked on the trade infrastructure. You can see the trade infrastructure in this picture. It's quite complicated, but I'm just going through it. So in the hospital, you have a lot of different data sources. Uh, you have the electronic medical records. Uh, which contain clinical data. Um, sometimes it's called the hospital information system. And actually, a lot of other things are in the hospital information system linked as well, such as images, um, biobanking information, so samples that are taken from patients, samples. Um, even public data is, a, is an important source for research. So clinical data, uh, patient data, imaging data, biobanking data, and also um, omics data, DNA, RNA, etc., cetera, um, can all be combined to create a picture, an understanding of um, how the patient disease biology works. That's what we're trying to do in TRAIT, trying to find um, relations or patterns in the data uh, combining these different types of data. And we do that either in uh, tools like R. Uh, just this afternoon we had a workshop. I think some of you were there where uh, we went hands-on using uh, Transmart and R. Um, but there's other um, tools as well, such as Galaxy. So Transmart is the tool that we use to bring this data together. The idea of Transmart is that you bring together clinical genetics and even sensors and imaging data to improve your understanding of biology and uh, medicine. And um, maybe you wonder, uh, what is open source about Transmart and where does this come from? Well, Transmart was created at Janssen, um, Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical company internally, and um, they used it to load clinical trial data from patients and also um, biomedical data like DNA data from their clinical trials. However, in 2012, they decided to make their internal uh, software open source so that other pharma companies and also uh, universities and medical centers could start using it. Um, you have to understand that pharma companies historically are uh, quite traditional companies, and certainly when it comes to uh, how you handle security and IT. So uh, for a pharma company to make open source software is becoming more and more common, but like 15 years ago was not, not common at all. And J&J, um, &J, I think, was uh, one of the companies that were more advanced in this, and so 
they tried it out. It was an experiment. They didn't know if they put the software on GitHub, if that would have any effect. But in fact, it did. As you can see in this timeline, there were a lot of projects, um, such as the trade project that I just mentioned, that just started to use the software. And uh, now it's, it's becoming one of the um, uh, main projects in translational medicine. So open source is a great way to create a standard in an industry. These are some of the contributors. Um, so some of these are also our clients, um, pharma companies like Pfizer and Sanofi, but also other universities like Harvard. Um, you can see here on the picture of um, meeting in Amsterdam. This was in 2013 when Transmind actually just, just was starting the community. And you can see there's already quite a number of different parties involved. You have here pharma companies, you have academic medical centers, you have IT companies like Thomson Reuters, um, you have Recombinant, Deloitte, and of course the Hive. Uh, we were also uh, present at this workshop in Amsterdam. Uh, over the year, you saw the Transmit community grow. So this was in 2014, there were more people. This was in um, uh, Michigan. Uh, BioIT World uh, last year, uh, we actually, this is my colleague, Wart, uh, who got an award, uh, very nice. And um, uh, last year in October, we had the, uh, the third annual meeting of Transmart, and there were already 160 people coming to Amsterdam. This is at the National Cancer Institute in uh, NKI AVL. But this is a screenshot of one of the newer interfaces uh, in Transmart that we're working on. It's actually showing you um, clinical data. Um, oh, I'm going too fast now. So here you can see the studies that have been loaded. And then um, this is a study with a number of uh, cell lines, cancer cell lines. Uh, I think looking at the uh, picture here. Another uh, tool that we use in trade, which is sort of downstream from Transmart, is CBioPortal. So this is an open source software that was created at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. They created this to allow the researchers from the hospitals, but also the doctors, to look at cancer data. Um, this picture here in the middle um, where it says overall survival is a couple of Maya plot. It's used a lot by, um, uh, by doctors to look at the survival rate of patients in a study. Um, but in this case, it's correlating it with genomics characteristics, such as the um, copy number alteration. So that's my first example, translational medicine. I don't know if there's any questions from you uh, on this topic. No. I have a question. Um, yeah. <coughs> so what does a, a hospital get out of correlating all that data? Like what is the added value of implementing those systems? That's a great question. So for cancer, in this example, right, see BioPortal, every tumor is basically unique. It has its own uh, signature, if you will. A different mutation in the DNA which causes the cells um, to stop doing one very important function, and that's dying, apoptosis. So this mutation called the, the cell to uh, basically keep on living and keep on uh, multiplying, thereby creating a cancer. It's at least one, um, one version of understanding it. And the hospital, it's very important to know what are the genetic characteristics of the tumor. Because if you look at the history, um, what drug has worked for uh, patients with a certain mutation, you can figure out a correlation between the mutations in the tumor and which drug work or don't work, then you can know in advance just by doing um, DNA or RNA analysis on the tumor, what drug will likely work for this patient. <coughs> and actually it, it has come this far that there are now already quite a number of uh, drugs on the market 
which are targeted at a specific population um, with specific this SNPs. is basically uh, this is basically a tool for personalized medicine or enhancing your this uh, type of body type or DNA type thus you should using this drug yeah that's exactly right and yes. it's always related to DNA or are there other characteristics um, well of course uh, whatever characteristic you load into the system you can look at um, but I haven't don't have it on the slide here but um, in biology, you have different levels. You have the DNA level, which is the encoding of the proteins uh, in the genome. You have the RNA level, which is um, the DNA is transcribed to RNA. And then eventually you have the protein level. Yeah. So all these three levels you can actually visualize in the C bio portal okay. and look at the, the relation between those. Cool. Yeah, another question. Thank you. Yeah, you see uh, more uh, focus on uh, systems medicine, systems biology, systems medicine, so that go even beyond that. So, for example, also include epigenetics, metabolomics, um, uh, microbiotics. Um, so instead of uh, organizing clinical trials where you have 1,000 patients where you look at just one dimension, uh, you probably in the future will have, uh, based on systems medicine, one patient uh, but uh, capture all the data that you have available on it. What do you think would such a system be feasible to monitor that and would eventually a collection of all that data for different patients be able to provide you um, the information that you need to select the right interventions? Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's a very important approach because we know from fundamental um, biology for example, um, in, in Amsterdam uh, from Westerhof, we know that n n not one of these levels uh, determine the whole biological outcome, the whole pathway outcome. All of them contribute in some way to the variation. Uh, so the DNA, the RNA, the protein level, even epigenetics is all important. And the metabolome, of course. The metabolome is also um, more and more of interest to researchers. However, um, it's very costly to generate these kind of deep data sets. So I think what you see in practice is that the data sets are generated. Um, but if you look in the literature, there's actually few papers that really do this kind of system medicine uh, in a human bio biology setting. I know a few examples. Uh, a great example is from uh, Stanford, from the Snyder lab. So this was actually about Professor Snyder himself. He collected uh, for one and a half year or so, he collected samples, um, blood samples, uh, tissue samples, I think also, and his medical records or his um, genome, if you will. And he created a paper. You should look, look it up, Mike Snyder, Stanford. So that's one of the hallmark papers, but I think because of the cost, that approach hasn't been done a lot yet. And also, um, in clinical trials, you have to create a very specific setup. I'll come back to that actually in the second topic. Any other questions before I move into... Okay. It's the last question, then we move... Uh So what's the open source governance structure? Is John, Johnson & Johnson still the maintainer and decides which pull request gets through or is it a community council? Or uh, that's a great question. Um, the open source governance model is, I think, different per tool. So in this example, CBIO portal was created at Memorial Sloan Kettering. It was made open source, so it placed on GitHub, basically. Um, we then work with them and also with Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston to add new features. And we have a call every week with the developers. So developers from Boston, from New York, from Utrecht, just call into the same call. Um, and also people from Canada and some other labs that are involved. So it's, it's a very grassroots type of uh, community. There's no formal governance, no foundation or anything. 
Transmart is very different. There's a whole Transmart Foundation, which has, I think, operating budgets of, of more than a million per year, which is just focused on um, uh, growing the Transmart community, and they have uh, things in place to do code governance, uh, quality checks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have meetings, like I showed you the pictures. I think both models work well. Um, and, and it might be that CBIO portal, when it becomes bigger, uh, also needs such an infrastructure. But yeah, it's really dependent on the project and the people. And in the end, an open source community is always about the people. Even if you create a, a big uh, foundation uh, around it, if the people leave or the people don't believe or don't, they don't get along, then you still have a problem. But I think both of these are great and healthy communities. Cool. So the next topic is population health data. Um, also, maybe uh, going into s a little bit more in terms of reusing health data, health on the whole population, for research purposes. Um, Last year uh, in Leiden at Corpus, we had a huge conference, uh, several thousand people, um, which are just focused on genomics and bioinformatics. So for that area, it's relatively large. And they came together in a meeting of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Ivan Bernie is a scientist from the European Bioinformatics Institute, and he said at the conference that if we want to make progress in healthcare, we really have to make better use of all the health data that we have lying around. So for example, hospitals know a ton uh, about which drugs work, which drugs don't work, but they're all sort of hidden and, and locked in um, repositories that we can't access. And if you then uh, look at drug development, there is another project problem, which is in the traditional drug development, you start with uh, drug discovery, so this is fundamental research almost, looking at um, biological pathways, and then you go into chemoinformatics, you start testing it on models, so you start testing on animals or on cell lines, and only when you have uh, identified what you think is a working compound, then you start doing phase one clinical trials. Um, a number of problems here. Uh, one problem is that we often see in, in um, drug development is that the animal models uh, don't always represent the human biology well, because the human biology just is very different. Um, another problem is this whole process takes years. Uh, it takes so long to develop a new drug. And all this time, um, you basically don't have anything for patients that, that, that can be dying. And even when you, the drug is on the market, um, you still have to do monitoring because a clinical trial is designed for a very specific purpose. A clinical trial is um, a controlled study where you test a hypothesis, namely, does this drug work better than the the standard of care, you test that by definition on a small population uh, because you want a very controlled research project, a very controlled uh, trial, and that's costly to do. Um, and every time again, we have to do a clinical trial. When you want to start a new hypothesis, you have to recruit the patients, you have to um, uh, give the drugs, and you have to look at the results. So this is very, very ineffective. Because if you think about it, a lot of the data that you're looking at is already present. Maybe not initially, but once the drug is on the market, then in a few years, um, all the hospitals and all the uh, caregivers, the doctors that are administering the patients together know a lot more than a pharma company that designed the drug. Because the pharma company only has this clinical trial data on maybe 10,000 patients if you have a very large trial. Um, but those hospitals uh, start gathering data of hundreds, hundreds of thousands or millions of patients. So as soon as a drug is on the market in a few years, there's this huge ball of data that's, that's sitting there, which is telling you something about 
uh, how effective the drug is, where it does work, where it doesn't work, which you just can't leverage. So the, the whole purpose of uh, population health and of observational studies is to try and do that. It's a very different kind of game uh, because you're looking at um, real world data, right? You're looking at the data from um, the hospitals, from the uh, primary care, so general practitioners, and also from academic medical centers. And in that um, hairball of data, you're trying to figure out what the effect is of, of your drug in real life. Uh, it's less expensive to do that. If you have the data available, you can actually just do a data science survey. Um, the example project I have for this is EMIF, the European Medical Information Framework. And the, the goal of EMIF is actually to become a trusted European hub for healthcare data. And um, we're just a few years into this project. It's huge. It has um, almost 60 partners. And in terms of the data, we have um, data on subjects that are in studies, which is a lot, 25,000, but much more on um, the general population. So we, in EMIF, potentially, we have access to 53 million European um, European data points, if you will. 53,000, 53 million people. Uh, and that's through the different data sets that we have in the consortium. I show you here a picture. So the biggest data set, thin, uh, is 12 million. And Pharma, which is actually the Dutch data set, has uh, also um, 10 million. So the data from 10 million Dutch people that are in some way or form in the healthcare system. Of course, this data is much more s shallow. You don't have genetics here, for example, but you can still look at uh, the effect of drugs versus uh, the general um, clinical attributes that you have. How do you get data from so many Dutch people? That's that's almost all of them. Yes. Well, they do that by combining a lot of data sets that are available. And of course, um, you have to realize there's one problem with this data also, and that's it's not easy to get access to as a researcher because they have this informed consent and they have all these contracts which um, make it hard. I, I can't just, for example, download this. This is definitely not open data, okay? So this institute is actually uh, located here in the Netherlands. Um, it has a, a number of national data sets that it puts together in one database, uh, but it's very strictly secured. And they can only uh, give access if you have a whole protocol defined, then they have to go to the different um, so-called so uh, data again, governance who boards. Is pharma? Sorry? Is that, who is pharma? Is that a pharma pharmaceutical? Is that no, no, no. It's a, uh, a company or an institute. Okay. Yeah. And what is in that data, for example, age, gender, uh, disease type, uh, how many times you went to the doctor, uh, all that, or is it very simple, age, gender, and that's it? No, the, uh, one of the key data here is um, uh, medications, right? Uh, actually, I'll show you um, the data model that we use. So now I'm progressing from the project EMIF to the tools we use in EMIF. So this is the data model we use to uh, capture this kind of data. And here, um, you can see there's a lot of data which is linked to the person. Observation peri period, first of all, is for example specifying if the patient is active. Uh, the if the data comes from an insurance company, for example, that then the window is uh, when this patient was insured by that insurer. If the data is coming from a GP, 
then it's uh, is is it an active patient in the in the practice? Um, so that's actually a very important data point because most or many of the people in this data set don't have any health problems at all or maybe don't see their doctor. Um, but you still want to know that um, they, they had no health problems, right? That's very important because otherwise you, you can't compare the effect of uh, the hypothesis that you're studying. Another thing here is um, looking at procedures. So if you, this is if you have data from the academic medical centers, for example, they can store what procedures were done, like surgeries, drugs, obviously. So um, whether any medications were taken, uh, devices, so medical devices. And even in some cases, you have lab measurements. So this could be uh, values from a blood test for example. So these are the type of data, but note that depending on the source, uh, so uh, one other example is, um, I think it's, no, it, it's not in this slide, but in Rotterdam there is a study which is run by Erasmus where they actually gather data from a number of GP practices in the area of Rotterdam. This is about two million people. And um, it's a huge amount of work to get the data from these people in one model because every GP practice has their own IT system in which they encode um, the patient records, the, the drugs that were taken. And what you have to do to build such a database is a lot of um, yeah, data science, a lot of ETL, if you will, to put it all into one model. It's hard work that does pay off, though, because once you've built it, you can start querying it. And um, it's also a live database, so once you've built the procedure to go from the source database into this model, you can keep updating it when new data comes in. But this is one of the things we do at the Hive uh, as a service, right? So we help uh, data sources to set up a, um, a, a way to get their data and transform it into the OMOP data model. Here's an example of uh, a screenshot, actually, from one of the Odyssey tools. So Odyssey is an another open source community, a set of tools that we work with. It's also on GitHub. And uh, we use this one to study the data that's stored in the OMOP data model. So in this case, we're looking at um, Optum, which is a large US data set, and that comes from um, insurance companies. So insurance companies also have records, uh, namely uh, what kind of uh, health expenditures they reimbursed. Right, and so from these reimbursements, you can also extract uh, a healthcare database. What I've done here is I've run a query where I looked at a number of um, in exclusion criteria. So this could be used when you're designing a clinical trial, and I can see the effect of the different criteria that I put here. So most of the population satisfied all these things. Like no, no prior warfarin taken, this is medication, uh, no anticoagulants in the past 183 days, no dialysis in the last 30 days, this is not a problem. But there's one inclusion criterion here, or exclusion, depending how you look on it, which is prior atrial fibrillation. And that's the one that limits the total set, um, where I'm only looking in total at um, 12,000 people. Hopefully it gives you uh, a flavor of um, something you can do when you've data an OMOP. This is a classical example. Pharma companies do these kind of studies when they attend to run a clinical trial and they want to know um, what's the best protocol to recruit the patients. Any more questions on this topic? So we are at already past uh, half. So I'll just go quickly over the last um,
topic. Oh, before I do that, ending with a quote. This is Johan van der Leij. He is uh, the co coordinator of the EMIF project. So the last example, it's, it's a very new one uh, in terms of variable census data. This project just started and we still have the, to do the kickoff meeting, which is uh, in June in Italy. Um, I'll be there with a, a colleague of mine to really meet the other partners in the consortium. But basically the radar CNS consortium is about using wearable devices for a number of important medical use cases, such as depression and also MS. The thing is that in a hospital, if, if you have a chronic disease uh, like MS or when you have a, a disease like depression, when you meet your doctor, you're only meeting your doctor maybe for 15 minutes or a half an hour. And um, if you have a neurodegenerative disease, say Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, um, you probably make sure that you're in your best shape when you visit your doctor, right? And when you come home, you're, you're exhausted and um, then you have to recover for three days. The thing is, the doctor at a hospital doesn't get the full medical picture. And one way to do something about this and to start really a dialogue between the patient and the doctor is to do continuous data gathering using uh, variable devices. That way, both the patients themselves, but also the caregivers can start looking at the real picture. So what happens when the patient's at home? Here is a number of um, example use cases that you can um, have a look at. So uh, a relapse in depression, wouldn't it be great if you can somehow uh, predict it, or even as a patient, if you can know uh, beforehand, or if, if you have an ap epilepsy attack, right? Can you predict this before happening? Would be very useful for the patient. So these are some of the things that are now possible, thanks to you know Android watch, watches, Fitbits, whatnot. Um, so this is really new area, but hopefully in this in this consortium we can both build the open source IT infrastructure to do this, and also test it with a number of top researchers in this disease area. Here are some of the examples um, in terms of what's possible already today to measure. You can look um, at your sleep pattern, you can look at um, the conductance of your skin, you can look at heart rates, you can do speech analysis. So one interesting thing is um, if you just take phone call data from people, obviously it's uh, privacy sensitive and you have to, to deal with that, but if once you do, can you maybe detect an early onset of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. This would be very useful because these diseases are very gradual and often are not um, detected by patients or doctors until they're already well into the disease. And this is actually my, my last slide. Um, what we intend to build in this consortium, and we're mainly working with, um, with King's College London and uh, Intel and a number of other IT companies uh, for this work package, is we're using open source software called um, OpenM Health Shimmer, which already um, is able to process and bring together data from a number of different devices, as you can see here. So if you have a Jawbone or an Android um, research kit or uh, so iOS research kit or an Android watch uh, using Google Fit, there's a number of data sources. And if you go on the OpenML website, you can see exactly which, which ones are supported. Um, so then the architecture that um, the other partners and we in the consortium are now building is using Apache Kafka, which is a 
a streaming analytics platform. I, I don't know if any screenshots because it's it's back end. Uh, I, I would show you code. But what it allows you to do is to collect data from a number of continuous data streams. And you can use that, for example, on your phone itself to, if, if I have sensor data um, from, say, a Fitbit, it goes to Bluetooth on my phone, and I can run this software on my phone to do a first analysis or a first summarization of the data. Alternatively, I can send everything to the cloud if I have a 4G connection and analyze it there. Um, finally, there are two things that we can now do once we have these data streams set up. We can start analyzing it by research protocols, but maybe even more interesting, we can also give it back to the patient so that you yourself can see your own data. And that if you are a data scientist, you can even start analyzing your own data. So these are the two things we intend to do uh, in this consortium. That was my last example. I don't know if there's any questions about this one. We'll open up the... So on this uh, last topic, how do you differentiate from larger IT companies that also are able to collect data and in one way or another utilize it or give it back? So can you elaborate a little bit on how you differentiate? Yeah, of course, um, the, um, all the technology companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, etc., are all already building uh, health data kits where you can see your own data. I think what's unique about this project is that we also collaborate with a number of top researchers in different areas like MS, depression, and that we connect the doctors and the clinical experts directly with the um, uh, IT uh, partners in the consortium. So rather than starting by building as a what's possible IT, we also want to bring the medical use case and bring that in. I think that's very uh, important differentiator. And of course, um, we're, we're building an open source uh, kit as well. Now many of the um, technology companies today do that also. Uh, but I think it's really important um, for health data in general and for um, the advancements in healthcare that we give patients, even citizens, tools to manage their own health. Because the current healthcare system is headed for, for failure. In a few years, we just can't afford it. I will need to give people the means to start managing some of their health themselves. And by giving them data, maybe we can give them a means to do so. Yeah. Um, so when I hear a lot of times open source, everything's for free, right? And uh, when you started your presentation, you had a team with 22 people. So you're in open source development, but what is the business model or of the Hive? Yeah, the business model of the Hive is services-based. So we help our clients to implement the software. We sometimes extend it if they're willing to pay for it. And of course, we also try to tap into uh, innovation money. So yeah. this radar CNS project is actually funded by the European Commission and a number of farm partners. Okay, cool. But basically, it's a service-based model, which yeah. also means our like company Ubuntu, uh, like Linux, basically. Sorry. Like Linux. Yeah, yeah, like Red Hat uh, yeah. is doing for Linux or Canonical for Ubuntu or yeah, these kind of yeah. models. Cool. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Um, one more question on, you were mentioning something about the atrial fibrillation uh, data pool that they weren't, uh, what was exactly the case with that data set? You were saying it was ranked number one, uh, but you said it's only 12,000 people. Okay, it, it was not clear what, um, what my point was. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I can uh, go back there. So... Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the effect of the inclusion rules. So I start out with a full population, 
And then when I start uh, adding criteria, with every criterion, the population becomes smaller because less people fit the criterion. So one of the things I can do here is to look at which are the criteria that affect my population the most, that really shrink it. And uh -huh. in this case, it's the first one that really shrinks uh, okay. it. Okay, clear. Yeah? Clear. Cool. If there's no more questions, going once, going twice, we have a gift for our speaker. Uh, okay. Please give a big applause. Thank you so much. We have a little gift for you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for cool. the presentation. Uh, yeah. Glad to do it. Yeah. Thank you for coming.